Hey, hey, welcome back. My name is Matthew Belzer. I'm your instructor, and today in our lecture series, we're going to be covering the digestive system. As always, I've provided you a set of learning objectives, so learn them, live them, love them. I've also provided you, if you go to Blackboard with a handout, you can either download that handout and print it out and take notes manually, or you can have that handout open as like a Word document and you can type out your notes. So before we get into the digestive system, I want to review what's meant by catabolic and anabolic anabolic reaction. Catabolic reactions, as we've already talked about, are reactions in which larger molecules are broken into smaller mo molecules with the release of energy. So when catabolic reactions occur, what we're doing is oftentimes we're breaking covalent bonds, right? And we're releasing these smaller particles, but because energy is held within covalent bonds, we're also releasing energy. Now, oftentimes, the energy from catabolic reactions is used in what are called anabolic reactions. Anabolic reactions are where we take smaller particles or atoms or molecules and we knit them together with bonds, oftentimes covalent bonds, to form larger, more complex molecules. These reactions don't require energy. These reactions absorb energy. And remember, energy is held within chemical bonds. So when you're thinking about a molecule, for example, here we have a molecule of propane, where the potential energy in that propane is being stored is when it, within its bonds, within those covalent bonds. And what you see are catabolic and anabolic reactions, and oftentimes one fuels the other. Now, when we're talking about digestion, we're going to kind of focus on catabolic reactions, the breakdown of macromolecules into what we call constituent particles that can be absorbed and used by the body. So remember that reactions are facilitated by enzymes. And another word for a catabolic reaction when we're talking about the breaking down of macromolecules are hydrolysis reactions. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Because all of the molecules we've looked at so far when we went over our biochemistry section are polymers. So proteins are polymers made up of individual building blocks or monomers called amino acids. Remember, proteins can also be referred to as polysaccharides. And what they are is amino acids linked together covalently in these long chains that fold into specific three-dimensional shapes. And then these polypeptides or proteins go out and serve a function. The polymer in this case is the protein. The monomer, the building block, is the amino acid. So when I say enzyme X breaks proteins down into their constituent particles, what I'm really saying is that enzymes break proteins down into amino acids, and it's those amino acids that are, are, are absorbed and used by the body. Polysaccharides or polymers, they're made up of many monosaccharides linked together covalently. So the polymer is the polysaccharide like starch, glycogen. The individual building blocks are the monosaccharides. So when you break polysaccharides down or disaccharides, you get monosaccharides like glucose, fructose, galactose. And it's those monosaccharides that can be absorbed and used by the body. Nucleic acids, things like DNA, RNA, We've talked about those extensively. When you break nucleic acids down, another word for a nucleic acid is a polynucleotide. Nucleic acids like DNA and RNA are build up, built up of these building blocks called nucleotides that we've talked about extensively. And when you break down a nucleic acid in the process of digestion, you break them down into nucleotides, and we actually absorb nucleotides along the GI tract. So each of these polymers is made up of monomers, and the process of digestion, when you think about the macromolecules, is breaking these polymers into these monomers that can be then absorbed and used by the body. So if I was to show you an image like this, we're looking at what's called a hydrolysis reaction. Now remember that all of these chemical reactions are being facilitated by enzymes. They're the catalysts of chemical reactions. They lower the activation energy. What they do is they kind of stress these chemical bonds by shoving a water molecule in, and in so doing, they break the covalent bonds between these monomers. So if I had monomer, 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 let's say I said the monomer above is a monosaccharide. What would the molecule be? Well, the molecule would be a polysaccharide. If I said the monomer above is a, an amino acid, what would the molecule be? It'd be a peptide or a protein. If I said it was a nucleotide, it would be a nucleic acid like DNA or RNA. And then it, during the process of digestion, 
there's a series of catabolic reactions, right? We have enzymes that essentially shove water molecules in, break those covalent bonds, and you get those individual monomers that can be absorbed and used by the body. So these monomers could represent monosaccharides like glucose, uh, amino acids like glutamine, uh, nucleotides, whatever it is, we need to break that stuff down before we can absorb it and use it in the body. So digestion, when you think about what digestion is, it's the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food into its constituent particles that can be used by the body. So when you're thinking about these macromolecules, these represent things like proteins, polysaccharides, disaccharides, nucle polynucleotides or nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. They also represent vitamins, minerals, things like that. You eat these foods through a series of catabolic reactions. We break these macromolecules down into their constituent particles and we release things like vitamins and minerals and we absorb those things along the GI tract. Those materials we absorb are then the building blocks for the anabolic reactions that are used to make us, quite literally, in a literal way, to uh, create or, or make the portions, the, the tissues of our body. So for example, when you eat a protein-rich meal and you you know, ingest a protein. It gets broken down into amino acids. We absorb those amino acids into our bloodstream. They're distributed throughout our body, and then we use those amino acids to make things like the proteins in our muscles. We assimilate those into our own body, right? When we eat a polysaccharide like starch, we break it down into glucose, then we burn that glucose for energy. So we use these things, and that's what digestion is. Now, there are two forms of digestion to pay attention to. We have mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion doesn't work at the molecular level. It works more at the macroscopic level, the level you can see. So chewing, a.k.a. mastication, is a form of mechanical digestion. Segmentation, which are a series of contractions that take place uh, along the small intestines, is a form of uh, mechanical digestion that mixes materials around. Churning, which is a series of contractions that takes place in the stomach, is kind of like a cement mixer. All of that stuff is just mashing stuff up and mixing it around so you can prepare it for the second type of digestion, which is chemical digestion. Chemical digestion is always facilitated by a group of proteins called enzymes. And remember, enzymes catalyze chemical reactions, meaning they're responsible for both catabolic and anabolic reactions. They lower the activation energy and they speed those reactions up without being used in the reaction. We've talked about enzymes extensively. Remember, enzymes always have the suffix ace. And when we think about digestive enzymes, let's take a look at this GIF here. So we have sucrose, which is made of fructose and glucose. This enzyme stresses that covalent bond, shoves a water molecule in, and breaks that disaccharide into its constituent parts, or the monomers, the monosaccharides that make it up. So the reactant here, the substrate of the enzyme would be the sucrose, and then the products, once it breaks that covalent bond that holds those monomers together, those monosaccharides, would be glucose and fructose, right? We can then absorb glucose and fructose along the GI tract and use them in the body. Now, the reason that they're called hydrolysis reactions is because it's a water molecule that actually stresses the covalent bond between the two, um, in this case, monosaccharides, right? So the you have a disaccharide made up of two monosaccharides covalently bound. That water molecule kind of gets shoved in there, disrupts the electron configuration, and that's why catabolic reactions are also known as hydrolysis reactions. So you often hear digestive enzymes referred to as hydrolytic enzymes. This would be an example of a di digestive enzyme. It would be called sucrase. So... When you think about the functions of the digestive system, there are five primary functions. Ingestion, taking in foods and liquids through the oral cavity. Secretion, we get tons of secretion. Water, acids, buffers, enzymes, mucus. We produce about nine liters of secretions along the gastrointestinal tract each day or the GI tract each day. 
right? We just reabsorb most of it. That is a whopping amount of secretion to produce. So secretion is really important to digestion. We get breakdown. We know the difference between mechanical breakdown, like mastication and segmentation, which we're going to look at a little bit more carefully when we trace some food through the GI tract. And then we have chemical breakdown. That happens at the molecular level, and that's really being facilitated by hydrolysis reactions, aka catabolic reactions, mediated by digestive enzymes. And remember, those enzymes are always going to end with the suffix ACE, and you're always going to see them above the reaction arrow if you're um, writing out the chemical reaction for them. Absorption is when we move material from the lumen of the GI tract, that internal tube, and we move it into the bloodstream or then to the lymphatic system. So water-soluble substances get absorbed directly into the blood, and then that blood is drained from the GI tract. You get the common drainage points of the superior mesenteric vein, the inferior mesenteric vein, the splenic vein, and they all feed into the hepatic portal vein and all that blood that drains from the GI tract, that nutrient and potentially toxin rich blood first go to the first goes to the liver. That's what hepatic portal circulation is, and the liver filters and processes that blood before it's allowed to enter into systemic circulation. Fats, on the other hand, are absorbed in uh, you, via they are absorbed across the lining of the intestinal tract into the lymphatic system and that's when we were talking about those lymphatic capillaries called lacteals and then there they flow along with the lymphatic circulation before eventually being reintroduced back to the cardiovascular system but that's absorption and then once things are absorbed and distributed throughout the body we can use them like amino acids and monosaccharides defecation anything that isn't all the indigestible material is going to kind of just pass through the GI tract and it's going to start to accumulate toward the distal end or the end of the large intestines, right? So large intestines, a major portion of it is the colon, and then it's eventually going to become compacted and all that indigestible material and oftentimes toxin, fiber, old cells are going to be eliminated in the process of defecation, which is also very important. Now, when you look at your paper, you're going to see a series of things on that paper. One of them is this image. And this image is really important because when you think of the GI tract, aka the alimentary canal, I'm going to use the term GI tract, but the alimentary canal essentially means the sustenance canal or the nutrition canal. but the GI tract, so the gastrointestinal tract, is one long tube that extends from the mouth to the anus. So everything that's part of the GI tract is part of the tube that extends from the mouth to the anus. So you have the oral cavity, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines, right? And then eventually the rectum and the anus, and it comes out the other end. All of those are considered structures of the GI tract, right? or organs of the GI tract. Now, all of the different segments of the GI tract, the oral cavity, the esophagus, the small intestines, the large intestines, they have a similar setup, right? And what we are looking at here is essentially the wall of the GI tract that you see starting essentially at the esophagus and ending at the distal segments of the large intestines. So the wall of the GI tract is very, very similar, right, from one segment of the GI tract to the next. So understanding the wall of the GI tract is actually quite important to understanding where you see those changes and why they're um, structurally and functionally significant from one segment to the next. So let's go ahead and walk through this particular image. So... When we're talking about the GI tract and we're using positional references, this tube right here, the hollow portion of the tube, we're going to call the lumen. And because material in this tube technically hasn't entered into your body, right, it's still considered kind of part of the external environment. We're kind of organized like donuts. We're going to refer to the lumen as being superficial, right, and then everything else as being deep. So I'm going to work from superficial to deep, and we're going to walk through the different layers of the GI tract lining, and we're going to talk about some variations and what to pay attention to as we go through different segments of the GI tract. So 
the most superficial segment, right, the one closest to the lumen and the one that's going to actually interact with the material passing through the GI tract, would be called the mucosa. The mucosa consists of an epithelial lining, a lamina propria, which is just a layer of areolar connective tissue that kind of latches that epithelial tissue down, lots of blood vessels running through it, and a little layer of smooth muscle called the muscularis mucosa. And the muscularis mucosa is just there to kind of twitch to dislodge material that gets caught up in the GI tract as it's passing through. Where you see the overwhelming majority of difference between one segment of the GI tract and another, especially at the histological level, is in the mucosa. In other words, what distinguishes the esophagus functionally from the stomach, from the small intestines, from the large intestines, where you see the biggest difference, especially under the microscope, between one segment of the GI tract and the next is within the mucosa. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the mucosa. One, because that's what actually interacts with the material in the GI tract. And two, this is where you start to see a lot of the change from one segment of the GI tract to the next. So we have the mucosa. Then, deep to the mucosa is a layer that's called the submucosa. This is made up of connective tissue, and it's richly perfused with glands. These glands in the submucosa are responsible for producing mucus that enters into the lumen of the GI tract and eases the passage of material through the GI tract. There's also lots of blood vessels being stabilized in this region. Now, superficial to that is what's called the muscularis externa, right? So we have the muscularis externa. So this muscularis externa consists of a circular muscle layer and a longitudinal muscle layer. That's not important for this exam or for this class, but I want you to know that it consists of smooth muscle. And this smooth muscle contracts rhythmically in order to propel material through the GI tract. Right? So this smooth muscle is responsible for contracting in order to propel material through the GI tract. So when we say GI tract motility increases, what we're really saying is that the activity in the muscularis externa is increasing. These muscular layers are contracting and squeezing and pushing material through the GI tract. When I say motility decreases, we're saying that activity in this particular region decreases. Right, meaning that this muscle relaxes and the GI tract in that particular region is just relaxing. Then finally, all of the GI tract structures starting at the stomach and extending to the large intestine are surrounded by an external layer called the serosa. And the serosa is made up of epithelium and areolar connective tissue. The serosa can also be called the visceral peritoneum. They can be used interchangeably in many respects, right? Especially when you're talking about those organs because this is part of the double-layered membranous sac that actually contacts the body organs directly. So serosa and visceral peritoneum can be used interchangeably. And one of the things you see is as the serosa kind of wraps around this organ here, we'll uh, think of it as a section of the small intestines, it actually folds up and out and it stabilizes all these blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels that feed into the GI tract and it forms a very beautiful little structure called the mesentery. And we're going to see the mesenteries very quickly, but when you refer to the peritoneal folds, the reason that the mesenteries are classified as peritoneal folds is they're actually folds that extend directly off of the organs themselves. And you, the, there's two words or two names that you can apply to this. Now, with respect to the nerve plexuses, the interconnected network of nerves coming in here, you have what's called the submucosal plexus. The submucosal plexus, and you don't have to worry about the plexus of Meisner, regulates the activity of glands in the submucosa and essentially upregulates the activity of glands so they produce more mucus. And the 
My enteric plexus, MY means muscle, and then enteric means intestine. So the my enteric plexus actually regulates the activity of the smooth muscle. So when the my enteric plexus activates, you get increased motility or contraction of the smooth muscle here, which propels that material through the GI tract. So go through and label that carefully. There's going to be some labeling activities and some conceptual activities about this later on. And we're going to go ahead and move on. So a couple of contractile patterns that I want you to be familiar with so when I use these terms you don't get confused. Peristalsis is, so here we're looking at the esophagus. And when you swallow food, the esophagus moves that food from essentially your throat to your stomach. And the way that it does it is the smooth muscle in the esophagus contracts in a coordinated fashion in order to propel that food in just one direction. So if you hear right, a description of a contractile pattern within the GI tract in which I say something to the effect of adjacent, that means next to each other. So here are adjacent smooth muscle layers. Adjacent smooth muscle layers contracting in order to propel material in one direction, right? Or in order to propel material from point A to point B. Which contractile pattern are we looking at? We're talking about peristalsis. And peristalsis is a contractile pattern along the GI tract that's designed to move material from point A to point B. There's no digestion, there's no mashing it up, we're just trying to get it from one point to another point. So purely peristaltic organs that I want you to know, the big one is the esophagus. When you swallow, there's no digestion beside the residual digestion from the enzymes in the saliva taking place in the esophagus. Its job is just to move food from the throat to the stomach. That's what it does. So peristalsis is when adjacent smooth muscle uh, layers contract in order to propel material from point A to point B. A purely peristaltic organ, an example of that would be the esophagus. Segmentation, on the other hand, is when non-adjacent layers of smooth muscle are contracting. And when non-adjacent layers of smooth muscle contract, essentially what happens is you move material back and forth. So imagine that I had a you know Gatorade mix and then I wanted to mix it up. I'd move it back and forth. That's what shaking things up are. When non-adjacent layers of smooth muscle contract, it moves material back and forth and it essentially mixes that material up. When non-adjacent layers or segments of smooth muscle along the GI tract contract in order to mix material up, that is a form of mechanical digestion that we call segmentation. An organ where segmentation is very prominent, or it's the prominent form, uh, it's the most prominent form of the contractile pattern in that region would be like the small intestines. So think about that. Think about the difference between those and think about where those contractile patterns are actually taking place. Now, we don't get deep into peritoneal folds in this class because it's an introductory class, it's COVID-19, and I'm just trying to convey the basics here, and we don't have a lab component anymore. So the peritoneum is a serous membrane. All serous membranes, right, consist of a layer that contacts the actual organ, it's called the visceral layer, a layer that contacts the body cavity wall, called the parietal layer, and a cavity in between. So the layer of the peritoneum that contacts the organs, we call the visceral peritoneum. The layer of the peritoneum that contacts the body cavity wall, we call the parietal peritoneum. And the space in between is called the peritoneal cavity, which fi is filled with peritoneal fluid, which lubricates those organs so they can move around and it reduces friction in those particular areas. It kind of locks organs into place as well, but it's kind of a lubrication so these organs that are kind of glooping and glopping all over the place aren't rubbing on one another. Now, Two peritoneal folds that you need to be familiar with are the greater omentum and the mesentery. That's not all of the peritoneal folds. Those are the peritoneal folds you need to be familiar with in this class. Now, if we were to take a transverse section of the abdominal cavity and we were to look from superior to inferior, meaning from top down, here we have the liver, here we have the stomach, here we have the kidneys, and what you're looking at here 
So this would actually be from inferior to superior. I apologize. We'd be looking from the bottom up. I had to orient myself. I was like, wait a sec, that liver's on the right side. What am I doing? So it'd be from inferior to superior. And what we're looking at here, the liver, the stomach, and then what this particular image is intended to identify is the peritoneal cavity and what's meant by retroperitoneal. So when we look at this image, transverse section, abdominal cavity from inferior to superior. So bloop, looking up like that. And what we're looking at here, the layer of the serous membrane that actually contacts the organs itself that I'm indicating with, that I'm showing you with my cursor, my pointer. This is called the visceral peritoneum, right? So when the visceral peritoneum is surrounding the organs of the GI tract, it's also referred to as the serosa. You can use those interchangeably. It's just like the epicardium and the visceral pericardium. So you have the layer of the peritoneum that contacts the organ itself called the visceral peritoneum. You have the layer of the peritoneum that contacts the body cavity wall called the parietal peritoneum. And then you get the gap in between the two or the space in between the two, which is called the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity is filled with peritoneal fluid, which protects and lubricates organs. And it's a very, very important fluid. For example, if you're doing like peritoneal dialysis, I could go on. And it's, it's important. The peritoneal cavity is big too right? It, it surrounds all of those kind of abdominal pelvic organs. So if you have something like a ruptured appendix, it's going to spill all those toxins into this peritoneal cavity, and it's going to spread throughout the entirety of that region. So we have the peritoneal cavity, and then we have everything that sits behind the peritoneal cavity or posterior to the peritoneal cavity. We refer to anything that sits posterior to the peritoneal cavity as being retro, meaning behind, peritoneal, referring to the peritoneal cavity. Two organs that you need to know right off the bat that are considered retroperitoneal are the kidneys. They sit in the retroperitoneal cavity and they're kind of locked to the posterior body wall and they're very, very close to the posterior aspect of the body wall around these lumbar vertebrae. Now, the two peritoneal folds you need to know, the most obvious one that you're going to see in the cat dissection video that I have up for you guys is called the greater omentum. So you have this fold of the peritoneum that comes off and essentially latches to the dorsal cavity wall and it locks all of these abdominal organs into place. We often call this the fat apron. The greater omentum is just sheets essentially of adipose tissue that come down. When people start to accumulate, for example, abdominal obesity, what, what's actually getting bigger, the structure that's physically getting bigger there is the greater omentum. So when we do the cat dissection, there's fruit flies because I left a pineapple out, but when we do the cat dissection, right, we're going to see the greater omentum and you're going to see that the greater omentum varies. And often the larger, more well-fed cats prior to their euthanasia have these large greater omentums because they are able to tack some excess adipose tissue on to save for a rainy day, right, which came when they were caught and used for dissections and they never got to use it. But you can see it. You can see that this greater omentum gets larger or smaller and it's reflective of nutritional status. So you have the greater omentum. That's one of the things I want you to be familiar with. For this class, that's one of the major peritoneal folds. The other major peritoneal fold I want you to be familiar with are the mesenteries. So I think the mesenteries are quite beautiful. The mesenteries are the peritoneal folds that essentially stabilize the position of the small intestines and the intestinal tract. The intestines aren't just floating around like rope, like I've seen movies where they'll pull the intestines out like a rope, like in Lord of the Rings, right? And granted, those were orcs, but I'm assuming they're warm-blooded because they get cold and they're complaining about it, so they're endothermic species, right? They have a carnivorous diet, so they'd have large portions of small intestines. I'm assuming that it makes sense for them to have a mesentery from an evolutionary perspective. But anyway, so there's mesenteries. And these mesenteries stabilize the position of the small intestines and also the blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves that feed into and out of the intestines, right? So they're very beautiful. You can see them really readily. And in fact, some textbooks refer to the mesenteries as being another organ.
right? They don't even refer to it as a connective tissue structure. It's just an organ or a peritoneal fold. Some textbooks refer to them as organs. They're really, really important. And I think they're quite beautiful. So here are your mesenteries. They stabilize all the blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves that feed into this region. They also stabilize the position of this very long structure. I mean, the small intestines can be over 20 feet, right? You can't just have that stuff floating around. So the mesenteries kind of lock it into place. So if the small intestines were to pop out, they'd pop out as a glob, like in Saving Private Ryan. That's a much better movie to uh, see how the small intestines would actually come out of your body if they were to come out. Not going to focus on peritoneal dialysis. So now we're going to take a little trip through the GI tract and we're just going to start at the level of the oral cavity and work our way all the way to the anus. When we talk about organs of the GI tract, we're talking about all the organs that are part of the muscular tube that extends from the mouth to the anus. Everything that's part of that tube is considered part of the GI tract, aka the alimentary canal. Anything that contributes to digestion that's not part of the GI tract or not part of that muscular tube, but produces secretions that ultimately help the activity that's taking place in that muscular tube are called accessory organs of digestion. So things like the salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder. And what we're going to do is we're just going to start at the top, work our way through, and then that's going to be the end of the lecture today. Now, just a quick review. We have exocrine glands. Exocrine glands, right? produce a secretory product that's released into a duct and that duct empties onto a surface. That surface could be the lumen of the GI tract if we're talking about the exocrine glands associated with digestion. And when they're in the lumen of the GI tract, they can help facilitate digestive processes. Remember, exocrine glands are a little bit different than endocrine glands. Endocrine glands produce chemical messengers called hormones that they secrete directly into the blood, and those messengers are transported through the blood to a distant target cell where they bind to a receptor and exert their response. So when I say this is an exocrine gland or an endocrine gland, or it has both exocrine and endocrine functions, that's what I'm really talking about. So we have the oral cavity. Ingestion. You ingest food and drink, and then within the oral cavity, there's a couple of different types of breakdown. The first type of breakdown is mechanical breakdown called mastication. Mastication is just chewing food up. It's a fancy word for chewing. When you chew food up, you mash it up and you get it prepped so enzymes have more surface area on which to interact with those macromolecules. There's also a bit of chemical digestion that takes place in the oral cavity uh, with the saliva. Now the mouth, the oral cavity is part of the GI tract, but the teeth and the tongue are considered accessory organs of digestion. So we're going to look at those really quickly with a focal point on the teeth. <clears throat> right? So when you look at a tooth, you're probably following along with your handout right now and you have that image of the tooth. I'm only going to stick to what's on our common course objectives for the tooth. So teeth are broken into two major regions. You have the region of the tooth that you can actually physically see, which is called the crown. And you have the region of the tooth that locks into the alveoli, the holes in the skull of either the maxilla or the mandible. And that's called the root of the tooth. The root is actually much larger than the crown. It doesn't seem like it would be that way, but if you've ever seen somebody with their tooth knocked out, the root is way bigger than the crown. Now. The region at which the crown ends and the neck begins is essentially the gum line. So the neck of the tooth is the part of the tooth that extends through what's called the gingiva or the gums. Now, if the gums start to recede away, you'll get deeper pockets and during a periodontal probe, they'll actually tell you that you have deep pockets here. That's not a good sign with respect to the health of your gums. You want healthy gums because you don't want to lose your teeth preemptively. So you have the neck of the tooth. Now with the tooth itself, blood vessels and nerves feed in to the tooth via what's called the root canal. And then the root canal broadens out in this large area called the pulp cavity, which contains all those blood vessels and nerves. Those blood vessels and nerves are actually providing nutrients and oxygen to this tissue that forms most of the tooth itself. This tissue, this softer tissue that forms most of the actual crown and the root of the tooth is called dentin.
You can see when somebody wears through their enamel that underlying dentin is kind of a yellowish color and it composes most of the actual mass of the tooth. Lining the crown of the tooth is the hardest substance in the human body called enamel and that enamel is intended to protect all of these underlining structures but you can wear that enamel away if you like grind your teeth at night and you can really clearly see that dentin. Right so enamel is a substance, dentin is a substance this is a structure, this is a structure, this is a region, 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 this is a structure. So think about the way that I would ask those on something like a lab practical. The final things I want to point out is this layer of kind of protein glue that locks the tooth into the skull itself. It's called cementum. And the cementum interacts with a very small ligament called the periodontal ligament. And these periodontal ligaments essentially lock the tooth into place. So you have a layer of glue that allows these ligaments to attach to the root of the tooth, right, locking it in the skull. And that's that immovable joint that we had talked about when we went over the skeletal system called a gomphosis. So those are the structures of the teeth you need to know or of an individual tooth you need to know. We're not going to talk about the dental formula or the different types of teeth. That This is an intro class. You learn that in AMP2. I'm happy if you just know the structure of a tooth. So you have the teeth, they mash food up, they rip, they tear food off, they mash it up, they grind it up. And what gets introduced into the oral cavity while the teeth are masticating food is saliva. Saliva is produced by the salivary glands. Just recognizing the salivary glands is important. So you have the parotid gland, the submandibular gland, the sublingual gland. Now, in AMP2, we go into a tremendous amount of detail about the type of tissues that make these up and the composition of the saliva. Don't worry about this for this intro class. Essentially, these guys produce saliva, and saliva is a complex chemical mixture that has enzymes like salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is an enzyme that breaks down polysaccharides into smaller components. So the chemical digestion of uh, carbohydrates begins in the mouth. So if you leave a cracker in your mouth for a long enough period of time, it'll start to taste sweet because this salivary amylase is breaking down those polysaccharides like starch into monosaccharides like glucose, which can trigger the, the sweet receptors um, located in the taste buds of your tongue. You get antimicrobial enzymes that can destroy things like bacteria. You get antibodies, which contribute to immune response. And you get mucus, which just kind of lubricates that ball of food or that bolus of food that you're making. So you have the salivary glands, and they coat that. You chew it up, and then you have a bolus, and you swallow this bolus. So it moves from the oral cavity into the pharynx. It goes from the oropharynx oropharynx to the laryngopharynx to the esophagus. I want to point out what happens here. So when you swallow, muscles lift up on the larynx and what happens is the epiglottis, this structure that covers up the glottis or the airway in the larynx, right? When you lift up the larynx, the epiglottis snaps shut over the airway, ensuring that food and drink will enter into the esophagus. The esophagus is actually latched to the posterior aspect of both the larynx and the trachea. So the esophagus runs behind the larynx and the trachea. But I want you to notice that epiglottis right there when you swallow that prevents the movement of food into the airway. That's important. So now we've directed that food into the esophagus, and the esophagus is going to carry out these peristaltic contractions to move food from the throat to the stomach. One of the histological features of the esophagus I want you to recognize is in the mucosa. So if we're looking at this image here, here's your mucosa where you see a large amount of change from one segment of the GI tract to the next. Here's your submucosa. Here's the muscularis externa. And then this out here is what's called the adventitia. The esophagus actually doesn't have a serosa or a visceral peritoneum. It has a thing that just wraps around the esophagus itself called the adventitia. So I could ask you to label any of the layers of the GI tract wall there, right? We have the mucosa, and then you have the epithelial layer, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa, the submucosa, and then the muscularis externa. But 
How would you be able to tell this was an esophagus? Well, for this class, you're going to go and you're going to go to the most superficial region, the region lining the lumen. And what you see there is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. The esophagus has stratified squamous epithelium because it's subject to lots of chemical and mechanical abrasion and forces, and you don't want it to tear apart. And because the esophagus isn't absorbing nutrients or carrying out any kind of digestive process, you just want that material to get from point A to point B safely, right? So the esophagus is lined by this non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium because it's tough tissue and it protects the lining of the esophagus so you don't rip it apart by swallowing like a Dorito or drinking Mountain Dew, which is essentially poison. Now that peristaltic contraction transports that material, that food, from the esophagus into the stomach. Now, movement through the GI tract itself is regulated by a series of sphincters circular layers of muscle that regulate the movement of material through the GI tract, or anywhere, but through the GI tract in this case. The first sphincter I want you to know is referred to as the lower esophageal sphincter, or the LES. The lower esophageal sphincter regulates the movement of food from the esophagus into the stomach. So when you're swallowing, the lower esophageal sphincter is relaxed in order to allow food in. And when you're not swallowing, the lower esophageal sphincter is contracted to prevent the movement of material out of the stomach into the esophagus. Your stomach is much higher than you think. It's actually directly inferior to the heart, so you can actually see the diaphragm here, and then there's a hole in the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus that allows the esophagus through. And your stomach is much higher than you think it is. So when material from the stomach, if the lower esophageal sphincter, a.k.a. the cardiac sphincter, fails, it's not working properly, material from the stomach gets regurgitated into the esophagus and it can produce pain in the esophagus that we often associate with heartburn. And if that happens consistently, then you probably have a disease called gastroesophageal reflux disease. So you get the lower esophageal sphincter, a.k.a. the cardiac sphincter. It relaxes as food moves into the stomach. So now our focus is going to be on the stomach. The three structures you need to know. So there's the lower esophageal sphincter. It relaxes, allows food into the stomach. The folds in the stomach, which is a J-shaped organ, which can be around the size, not much bigger than your fist, all the way to over a gallon. It has tremendous stretching capability. And the reason it can stretch so much is because of these structures or these folds called rugae. So rugae are the folds in the stomach that allow it to stretch out to accommodate for food and drink. Once food enters the stomach, it mixes with hydrochloric acid, and digestive enzymes, specifically pepsinogen or pepsin, which starts the chemical breakdown of protein. Once food mixes with hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, it is no longer called food. It is a substance referred to as chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. So now chyme is what's being mixed around. So when food mixes with hydrochloric acid and enzymes, it's no longer called food, it's called chyme. And that chyme gets moved through the stomach to the end of the stomach, right, as it's being prepped for the absorptive phase of digestion. And what regulates the movement of that chyme from the stomach to the initial segment of the small intestines, the first segment of the small intestines is called the duodenum. So when we do the cat dissection, I actually have you trace the stomach to the very end to that tube at the end and I say what segment of the small intestines is that? Well it's the initial segment called the duodenum and I always expect you to be able to identify that during the cat dissection. And what regulates the movement of food into the duodenum is another sphincter called the pyloric sphincter. So you have the lower esophageal sphincter which allows food in, food enters, mixes with hydrochloric acid and enzymes to become chyme, rugae allow the stomach to expand, and then that food exits via the pyloric sphincter and it enters into the duodenum of the small intestine. One of the unique things about the stomach at, a ma at the macroscopic level is not only its J-shape and the rugae that allow it to expand, but the fact that there are actually three layers of smooth muscle in the wall of the stomach and it allows the stomach to carry out a contraction called churning.
Churning is a form of mechanical digestion. It's kind of like a cement truck mixing stuff up, and it just mixes stuff up nice and good in preparation for the absorptive phase that's going to take place in the small intestines. So when we're looking at the stomach, again, this is the intro class, so there's a lot of things on this that we don't need to know. We have the lower esophageal sphincter, food enters into the stomach, mixes with hydrochloric acid and enzymes where it becomes chyme. That chyme is then allowed into the duodenum of the small intestines by the pyloric sphincter. One of the unique anatomical features of the stomach is that within the muscularis externa, you have three layers of smooth muscle, and these three layers of smooth muscle allow for the churning of material, the churning of chyme, which mixes it up almost like a cement mixer, mixes that material up nice and good. When we think about stomach histology, remember that I said we are always going to focus on the mucosa when we're thinking about the histology. So in the esophagus, the mucosa is lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Tough stuff. You don't want to tear or mechanically degrade the esophagus. But then material gets into the stomach, and we need to start introducing things like secretions to that food to turn it into chyme. And where that happens, right, where that functionality occurs is within the mucosa of the stomach. So this particular histological image, whoop, pardon me, is one of my favorite. It is such a good image of the mucosa of the stomach. It's so good. So when you look at the mucosa of the stomach, right, here we have the epithelial layer and then the lamina propria and the, the lamina propria and the muscularis um, mucosa. But what we are looking at here on this image is the mucosa of the stomach. And the mucosa of the stomach is broken into three layers. So we have these little things called gastric crypts or gastric pits. These gastric pits are just these really kind of like, if you were to trace one of these, it would almost be like walking along the ground and having a bunch of manholes that you could fall in. That's what a gastric pit is like. And these gastric pits are lined first by what are called mucus cells or mucus neck cells. These mucus cells at the most superficial surface that actually comes into contact with food and turns it into chyme secrete this layer of bicarbonate-rich mucus that protects the lining of the stomach from the acidic environment inside the stomach. Most of the diseases that cause things like gastric ulcers do so by interfering with the activity of mucus cells. So that layer of mucus, that bicarbonate-rich or basic mucus lining the stomach is really important. Parietal cells, which kind of look like the, these lightly staining cells that, to, in my estimation, look kind of like bubble wrap, are responsible for producing hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid travels up these gastric pits and then it enters into the lumen of the stomach where it mixes with food and contributes to the formation of chyme. Chief cells create a substance called pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is an inactive enzyme. So pepsinogen is an inactive enzyme, and as it percolates up through the gastric pits, when it comes into contact with hydrochloric acid, right, that enzyme gets converted into the active form of the enzyme called pepsin. And pepsin is an enzyme that begins the chemical breakdown of proteins, meaning it breaks peptide bonds and it starts releasing things like amino acids. When hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes mix with food, you no longer call that substance food, you refer to it as chyme. So food enters the stomach via the lower esophageal sphincter. It leaves the stomach via the pyloric sphincter. The mechanical folds, or the expanding folds, pardon me, are called rugae. Mechanical breakdown results from churning, which is possible because there are three smooth muscle layers in the muscularis externa. Know the function of parietal cells, chief cells, and mucus neck cells. These all exist within the mucosa. This is an image of the mucosa of the stomach. So as we continue to move through the digestive tract, material is going to move from the stomach to, to the duodenum of the small intestines. And it's at the duodenum of the small intestines that many of the accessory organs of digestion contribute to the digestive process. Now, with respect to digestion, you have your liver. It has four lobes. We don't even focus on the lobes of the liver in the intro class. We just focus on the two major functions of the liver with respect to digestion. 
So the liver, major function number one is all the blood leaving the GI tract first goes to the liver where it's filtered and processed before it's allowed to enter into your systemic circulation, right? That's called hepatic portal circulation. Major function number two that we haven't talked about yet is that the liver synthesizes or it makes bile. So the liver physically synthesizes bile, and bile is a mixture of a lot of different things, but it's essentially a detergent that breaks up fats. So bile is really important in the digestion of fats, and we won't get into the chemical constituents that make bile up, but bile is really important in the digestion of fats. That bile then enters into the hepatic ducts, and whereas the liver synthesizes bile, if we're not actively digesting fats, that bile gets routed into this structure or this organ that's actually embedded up in the lobes of the liver, and this organ that's embedded in the lobes of the liver that often takes on a green appearance, like even in the cats, because bile is green. So if you've ever vomited so hard that you've started vomiting up green, you're probably moving stuff out of your small intestines, bile specifically. So the gallbladder doesn't synthesize bile, it stores bile, right? Now, bile is a substance that essentially makes, it, it, it's a detergent that breaks fats up. That's what bile is. So bile is a detergent that breaks fats up, and it gets stored in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder stores that bile, and then the muscular wall of the gallbladder will contract and it will move that bile out into this bile duct, which will eventually fuse with the pancreatic duct to form the hepatopancreatic duct. And that bile will then move into the small intestines where it will break down fats. The detergent-like activity that breaks down fats is called emulsification. So bile technically emulsifies fats. That's essentially breaking fat droplets into very small droplets that can be absorbed along the GI tract. It's really important in the digestion of fats. It emulsifies fats. So the gallbladder stores bile, releases it, and eventually it enters into the bile duct, the hepatopancreatic duct, and then it enters into the lumen of the small intestines. Now the pancreas consists of both exocrine and endocrine tissues. The endocrine tissues of the pancreas we've already talked about with the islets of Langerhans that produce insulin and glucagon that play an important role in regulating blood glucose. That's what the endocrine portion of the pancreas does. The exocrine portion of the pancreas produces pancreatic juice and digestive enzymes. Pancreatic juice is a really bicarbonate rich secretion that enters into this thing called the pancreatic duct. That pancreatic juice mixes with that really acidic chyme and it buffers it out. It raises the pH so the acidic chyme doesn't destroy the lining of the small intestines. The digestive enzymes, when they come into contact with that chyme, activate and they facilitate the breakdown of different macromolecules. So pancreatic amylase breaks down carbohydrates. Pancreatic proteases like trypsin and chymotrypsin break down proteins into, you know, uh, um, amino acids. Uh, pancreatic lipase breaks down fats. Pancreatic nucleases break down nucleic acids. Really, really important for digestion, these digestive enzymes. So all of these mixtures mix within the duodenum of the small intestine, and for that reason, I always ask you to be able to identify the duodenum, even though it only accounts for about 5% of the length of the small intestine. That's where all of these major accessory organs are contributing to digestion. Now, the small intestines themselves, right, are the major point at which absorption occurs. The overwhelming majority of water, electrolyte, vitamin, mineral, and nutrient absorption take place within the small intestines. So everything about the small intestines is adapted for absorption. Everything about the small intestines is adapted for absorption. So at the macroscopic level, you get these circular folds. And what these circular folds do is increase the amount of surface area available for absorption to occur. Now, the small intestines is about 22 feet long in humans. It consists of the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So if you were to look 
at the lumen of the small intestines and draw a focal point to the mucosa, you would see something kind of like this. Now remember, when I draw a focal point to the histology and the functional parts, right, the functional aspects of each different segment of the GI tract, I'm always going to come back to the mucosa. So when you're looking at this here, what you are looking at is the mucosa. So macroscopically, the small intestines has this series of folds called the circular folds. But microscopically, those circular folds have another network of folds on them, right? And these, this other network of folds within the mucosa of the small intestines, these finger-like projections or these finger-like folds individually are called a villus, plurally are called villi. And these villi are these finger-like projections that increase the amount of surface area available for absorption to occur. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the mucosa. Here we have the epithelial layer, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa, right? So we're looking at the mucosa of the small intestines. The telltale characteristic of the mucosa of the small intestines are these finger-like projections called villi. What are they there for? They're there to increase the amount of surface area available for absorption to occur. So you have these simple columnar epithelial cells called absorptive cells. Remember when we talked about histology and we talked about simple columnar epithelium being really good at absorption? Well, that's where we're coming back to. So these absorptive cells are really simple columnar epithelial cells that allow for absorption to occur. Water-soluble things like amino acids, sugars, vitamins, and minerals get absorbed into blood capillaries. They enter into the blood, and then that blood is taken to the liver where it's filtered and processed, and then all of that material that isn't taken out by the liver is allowed to be distributed throughout your body and used by your body. Fats, on the other hand, are absorbed into these special lymphatic capillaries called lacteals, and they enter into lymphatic circulation before they enter into your blood circulation, which has some interesting consequences to it. Now, one of the anatomical, so definitely understand a villi, like if I put a bracket around this and I said, which of the following would be true? This is a villus. Villus are unique anatomical features of the mucosa of the small intestines. Their job is to increase the amount of surface area available for absorption. Now, lining each villus are these absorptive cells. These absorptive cells have these subcellular structures called microvilli, and these microvilli are another set of folds that increase the amount of surface area for absorption even more. So it's fold upon fold upon fold. So you have three separate networks of folds that geometrically increase the amount of surface area available for absorption to occur. These microvilli lining the small intestines we refer to as being our brush border. And we don't get too into brush border enzymes in intro, but suffice it to say that brush border is really important. So when you think about the overwhelming majority of absorption taking place, water-soluble substances like sugars and amino acids are absorbed directly into the blood, whereas fats are emulsified and they get absorbed not into the blood, but into the lacteals, which are part of the lymphatic system and enter into the lymphatic circulation. Now, finally, we get to the large intestine. The most prominent segment or portion of the large intestine is called the colon. Now, you get a lot of water and electrolyte absorption. In fact, a lot of the mediation of how much water and electrolyte you're absorbing actually happens within the um, large intestine, specifically the colon. And you get a little bit of digestion. And that digestion is facilitated not as much by our own native enzymes, but back by bacterial enzymes. Essentially, that food gets broken down by bacteria. Now, although we don't have much time to talk about it in this class, Within your large intestines, you have about three pounds of bacteria, right? That, that's more mass in bacteria in your colon than what makes up your brain. We have billions upon billions of bacteria in our colon, so many, in fact, that some people refer to the bacteria in the colon as being the 12th organ system. But we refer to the little microorganisms that live along the colon as being what's called our microbiome, right? Now, some of these organisms can be beneficial, like Acidophilus and uh, Bulgaris and Bifidum. 
And these guys can do things like repair the GI tract wall, produce little metabolites that are important for neurological regulation. I mean, they have downstream consequences on everything. And then you have bacteria that if they get out of control or little microorganisms like fungi that if they get out of control can be really problematic. So this microbiome is really, really important. And if it starts to break down, you can actually get mechanical deficits in the lining of your GI tract that can lead to, you know, diverticulitis and irritable bowel syndrome and leaky gut syndrome. So these microorganisms play a really important role. And I encourage all of you to read about the microbiome. So when we're looking at the large intestines, it's broken into the cecum, this little pouch right here, the appendix. The appendix is a little worm-like structure that projects off the inferior aspect. It is a reservoir for bacteria, essentially. There's a lot of bacteria that exist in the appendix. Now, if the appendix gets swollen shut and those uh, bacterial... Uh, oh, and bacterial overgrowth occurs, right? You can actually get an appendix that'll become swollen, and if it, it eventually, if it isn't taken out, it'll burst, and it can spread all those toxins throughout the peritoneal cavity, and that's really problematic. Then we have the colon, which is this entire segment here. Now, these little pouches in the colon are called haustra. This strip of smooth muscle that puts tension on the colon uh, is called the tinea coli. So you can see that in the different uh, structures, the spelling in the different structures from your lab. So then we have the distal end, which is the rectum. And finally, we have the anal canal, which is regulated by a sphincter. So we're going to start looking at the large intestine, and we're just going to start by tracing food through. So here's the ileum of the small intestine, chyme, chyme. Chyme moves from the ileum of the small intestine through what's called the ileocecal valve, which prevents the uh, movement of bacteria from the large intestine to the small intestine, which can cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and be really problematic and lead to all sorts of different diseases that you don't want. But we have the ileocecal valve, which prevents backflow from the large intestine to the small intestine. So ileum, ileocecal valve, chyme moves from the small intestine to the large intestine. We have the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure because it flexes or bends very close to the liver, the transverse colon, the splenic flexure because it's very close to the spleen, the descending colon, the sigmoidal colon, and then the rectum and the anus. So be able to recognize those different segments of the colon because when you're doing, uh, when a medical professional is performing a colonoscopy, what they're doing is essentially putting a tube and evaluating all of these different regions of the colon. Now, the rectum is just a muscular tube where fecal matter will start to compact. Once it gets there, there's not much absorption occurring. That's stuff that's going to come out the other end. And then the anus consists of two layers of muscle. One of these muscular sphincters is called the external anal sphincter. The external anal sphincter, along with other muscles, actually is made of skeletal muscle, meaning it's under conscious control, and it regulates the movement of fecal matter out of the anus and into the external environment, wherever it's going to go. And that is the digestive system in a nutshell.